Okay, hello everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to announce our speaker, Neil Dentham. Neil is an assistant professor at the Colorado School of Mines, where he leads the dynamic uh, automata lab. Before starting in Colorado, uh, Neil did his PhD with Mike Spielman at the Georgia Institute of Technology. And after he finished his PhD, he moved to Rice University in Houston, Texas, where he did the postdoc with Julia Kavraki at the Kavraki lab. Neil is uh, an expert on task and motion planning, and he developed and maintained the task motion kit, the, uh, the software for task and motion planning. He was finalist for best paper award at Humanoids, Humanoids 2014, and he organized several workshops on task and motion planning at the Robotics Science and Systems Conference. And of course, as we all know, task and motion planning is a very difficult problem, and to solve it efficiently would probably require good abstract uh, representations and Neil will talk today about such uh, abstractions and in particular how to plan robustly with abstractions and what the combinatorial and geometrical challenges are. Uh, I am therefore happy that he accepted our invitation and here he is, Neil Denton. Okay. Thank, thank you, Andreas. Let me share my screen here. Okay. So yeah, th thank you very much for the uh, the invitation, and I'm happy to be able to, to talk to you today. Um, so let me tell you about um, abstractions in robot planning. Uh, so I think we're all kind of motivated by robots that will uh, help us with our everyday tasks. So you know, cook our food, or, or do our dishes, or assemble our, our furniture. Um, so these kind of tasks combine both uh, symbolic and geometric decisions. Uh, so we have symbolic decisions about actions and objects and ordering, uh, and geometric decisions about collision-free motion. So for real-world action, uh, we really need both of these kinds of, of reasoning. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you first about, I'll, I'll give you at least an overview of maybe my take on task and motion planning and how um, the algorithm that I developed uh, during my postdoc uh, works and then some of our continuing work on uh, completeness and uh, feasibility as, as it relates to task and motion planning. Uh, and then if I, if I talk quickly enough, I'll, I'll go on a little bit of a tangent on uh, quaternion kinematics. Uh, okay. So uh, I think we all know it, it, in, in this talk, I, I, I have to include this slide because we overload terms in robotics, right? Task can mean a bunch of different things. In this case, it, we're talking about the discrete or symbolic or classical kind of, of planning, uh, and then motion is our continuous or geometric planning. Um, okay, uh, so here's here's a partial roadmap of different kinds of uh, of planning approaches. So we have task planning and, and motion planning, and you can do task planning using heuristic search or constraint-based methods, or some folks do uh, logic programming, um, and you can do motion planning using uh, heuristic methods or sampling-based planning or these local or optimization-based approaches. Um, I guess one thing you could take away from this figure is that, uh, well, I see heuristics on both sides. So clearly that's, that's the answer for, for planning. Um, and that's sort of, um, that doesn't quite capture the, the, the issue here, right? Even in these, these constraint solvers, you have some kind of heuristics in, um, in sampling-based planners, you're using some kind of heuristics. So it's, it's really really comes down to the details of how you're searching uh, searching these spaces, right? You need a, a different kind of search to efficiently deal with large discrete or large symbolic spaces compared to these these large uh, configuration spaces uh, that we 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 deal with in motion planning through typically the sampling based or the optimization based based methods. Uh, so so the question to ask in motion planning is how you can you can efficiently search this this combined space with both the the discrete symbolic and continuous geometric uh, uh, parts. Uh, right, so here's our classic task planning problem, right? This, this blocks world problem where we take some discrete abstraction of a manipulation problem and we describe the positions and relative positions of these, these objects we're gonna manipulate using logical predicates. And we have some, some actions about how to, how to rearrange the blocks. Um, you can kind of think about this as a um, basically a big finite state machine, right? Or some kind of symbolic transition system, right? So we have we have different discrete states, and then our actions 
are are transitions between between these different different discrete states. And so for these small problems, I think we could actually fit the whole uh, finite automaton on one slide. But you know, for anything kind of interesting, right? You end up with you know more more states than there are grains of sand. Uh, so so the the question is how to how to deal with these these systems uh, in an efficient way. Um, so so here's our, our how we can define a task planning problem, right? We have a finite set of states, finite set of actions, some transition function, and some some start state, and then some set of goal states that, that we want to reach. And and there are a bunch of different ways you could think of to represent uh, this kind of planning domain, right? We just said you could think about it as a finite automaton. These strips or PDDL um, representations are kind of the de facto standard for for defining planning domains. Uh, and then a lot of people in robotics um, like these temporal logics, linear temporal logic, uh, for for defining um, discrete systems. Uh, there are some, you know, maybe subtle differences between these different representations, but but fundamentally, it's it's the same kind of thing. You have discrete symbolic state and transitions between uh, these discrete states. Um, so this this is the kind of thing we we want to deal with for for task task planning. Uh, Right, and then we know motion planning, you have a start and a goal, and you want to find your collision-free path from your start to your, your goal. Uh, and the, the cute name for this is the, the piano movers problem. Right, You have your world, your robot, your configuration space, uh, your initial configuration, and your goal, and you want to find your, your collision-free path. OK, so, so let's think of how we would put together task planning and motion planning. Right, What's, what's the naive approach? We'll, we'll find a task plan first. And then we'll find a motion plan for everything in that, that task plan. And then everything works, the end, talks over. All right, so that's, that's clearly not, not quite all there is, uh, all there is to it. Um, so uh, there are some issues that can come up if you try to just find a task plan and then, then find motion plans. So, so some task actions may not be feasible, right? We may have an object that's out of reach. One object may be occluding another object. So we may not be able to actually perform some some task action if we we think of that action uh, independently of the motions to to execute it, uh, and then we have interaction or coupling between task decisions and, and motion decisions. So as we rearrange objects, right, this changes the configuration space. Right, you you move an object, you can go put your hand where that object was, but not where it is now. Uh, and then we have uh, we can have coupling of the motion of different objects. Right, if you stack objects or put objects on a tray or a cart. Right then, then their motion becomes becomes coupled. So, so we want to want to capture this kind of interaction also when we're doing task and motion planning. Um, so, uh, a big issue in task and motion planning, and and something that I think has um, occupied a lot of my focus is the the current limitation of motion planning of high dimensional motion planning to probabilistic completeness. Right. So this means we. Um, we don't get definitive answers about whether a, um, a motion plan is, is feasible or not, right? If you're running some sampling-based planner, you know, in, in the limit, if the plan is feasible and assuming a positive clearance, right, you'll find a motion plan. But if you haven't found a motion plan yet, right, you don't know, well, is it because no plan actually exists or I just haven't spent enough time growing my search tree or my roadmap to actually find it yet? Um, so, so right. So, if we're doing sampling-based planning for um, uh, for some symbolic action, right? We it's we don't get information really about whether about if it's in, infeasible. Uh, so either we get a plan and we know it's feasible, or we get we get a timeout, right? We get tired of growing that search tree or roadmap, uh, and and at that point, then we don't really know if a plan exists or or, or not. Um, so, so this this creates some challenges for task and motion planning. Um, uh, at least it has to this point. I'll I'll say later in the talk. May, may, maybe there's a way around this, um, right? So we we cannot currently prove that an action is infeasible. So then the question becomes: Do we spend more time trying to do motion planning for a particular action, or do we go off and explore other parts of the space, try try other actions? Uh, so so we have this um, changing configuration spaces. Uh, so when the robot picks something up. That this changes the uh, the free configuration space, which changes where the robot uh, can can go. Uh, and then we get this coupling between objects. So as the robot moves the tray, um, objects that are stacked on the tray will will also uh, move. 
Uh, so we want to we want to capture this coupling. Um, I guess there are I I've seen three broad styles of integrating task and motion planning. So if you first you know flip this task planning and then motion planning, and you do motion planning first and then task planning, um, right? So you basically find a discrete abstraction or some kind of of roadmap, and then you can do task planning through that that abstraction or or roadmap. Uh, and and at this point, you you get rid of this problem of finding infeasible plans, right? So now you have a correct approach, right? Every every plan in that roadmap should be feasible, and you just want to find the one that will satisfy whatever task constraints you you want. Um, and so this this approach is kind of closely related to um, some of the the discrete abstraction and then synthesis approaches that that um, some people I, I think originally coming out of Penn have been doing for uh, maybe fifteen years now. Um, uh, kind of more on the controls um, controls theory side or from the controls theory perspective. Um, right, you find a discrete abstraction, then you do some kind of synthesis uh, using that that discrete abstraction. So so same same kind of idea. Um, the the other uh, second approach is to call uh, a a motion planner kind of as as a subroutine or or what's sometimes called a semantic attachment from uh, within a task planner. Um, so if you your task planner is considering some particular action, right, you'll call the motion planner as a subroutine to determine feasibility uh, of that action. And so so the way this is used, right, if you get a plan, I. Uh, you know that the action is uh, feasible, uh, but then if the motion planner will time out, then these approaches, um, a, a, as I've seen them, will assume then that the action is is infeasible, um, and and then go off and do try something else. Um, so th this can be be efficient, um, right? Because you don't spend a lot of time on something that that is timing out because it's infeasible. Uh, but but then then you you may lose this this completeness by by assuming that timeout means infeasible. Uh, and then, so the the final style is to uh, to alternate task planning and, and motion planning, um, and and so this kind of corrects the problem of um, infeasibility and, and timeout. So you find a candidate task plan, you try to find motion plans, and then right if you find motion plans, you're you're you have your task motion plan. If you don't, uh, then you provide some kind of feedback to the task planner to to continue with task planning to build maybe some. Different kind of discrete abstraction or discrete discrete structure, um, or or find different task plans and and then iterate task planning and, and motion planning. Um, so I okay I guess I guess a question is I, I'm not quite sure if if this this categorization captures what your group does. So maybe maybe I need another another couple of boxes on this slide. You can you can tell me later what what you think about that. Later. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so, so let me, let me talk about, um, our constraint based work for task and, and motion planning. Um, so we've combined the, uh, Z3 constraint solver or, or theorem prover with, um, this sampling based planning using OMPL. Uh, so just to remind people or get, get us on the same page about constraint solving, I'm really talking about Boolean satisfiability. Uh, so we're given a Boolean formula, and we want to find is there a satisfying satisfying assignment to this this formula, right? So what are the the values of the variables to make the formula true? Um, and so, for example, you can take this Boolean formula, uh, A or B, and not A, right? This is true. It's satisfiable if we make A false and and B uh, true. Okay, so so sand is uh, it's NP complete, right? This is the the canonical uh, NP complete problem from uh, Cook and Levin's uh, theorem. Uh, so, you know, okay, uh, despite all that, uh, people have put in a lot of work to figure out how to efficiently solve uh, these, these Boolean satisfiability problems. So the, the, the classic algorithm is this uh, DPLL backtracking search. Uh, the modern variation on that is called conflict-driven clause learning where uh, in one branch of the search, you'll learn which clauses will create conflicts and then try to avoid those clauses in some other branch uh, of the search. And, and so the, the net result of all of this engineering is that the current solvers can, uh, can effectively deal with uh, Boolean formula with, with millions of, of variables and, and clauses. Um, so you know, despite the fact that we shouldn't be able to solve these problems, 
uh, we can actually solve these problems in many uh, practical and, and interesting uh, cases. Uh, so, so you know, this is um, SAT is sometimes described uh, or called the assembly language of, of hard problems, right? Because you can take right, you know, from this Cook-Levin theorem, you can take all of these other difficult problems and and reduce them to SAT. And and with all of the engineering that has gone into SAT solvers, right, this is often an effective approach to to dealing with these. Um, you know, theoretically intractable uh, problems. Uh, and then, so this has been one of the, the effective approaches for task planning. Uh, so, so black box um, was for, for a time, uh, one of the faster task uh, planners. And then a little more recently, the Madagascar planner was I think a runner up in, in the 2014 ICAPS uh, competition. So, so a good, good approach for, for task planning uh, as, as well. Uh, so what we're using is not just SAT, but the satisfiability modulo theories. Um, so uh, right, theories are, are kind of this, these richer data types. Uh, so things like first order logic or enumeration or lists. Um, but what, what is, is especially important for us is not just this, uh, these theories, but the incremental assertion stack in the uh, SMT solver. So, so with these incremental solvers, it's not just uh, you get back sad or unsad, and and that's the end. Um, you can actually update the formula and and resolve. So um, the the way you do this is with this the stack of assertions, which is connected with the the backtracking search. So you can push an assertion or pop an assertion, and this this connects with the the backtracking points in in the solver. Um, so and, and there's there's a whole bunch of these different implementations of, of SMT solvers. Um, so it's, it's a nice set of tools that I think, um, I think we can use in the robotics community. Uh, so really we're using the, uh, the SMT solver as, as a nice way of searching the, the task space. Uh, so we find some task plan, we go off and try to find motion plans for that task plan. Um, if that doesn't work, uh, right, then we add some new incremental uh, constraint to try to find a different different task plan, um, and and so this this incremental solving um, gives us a several order of magnitude uh, speed up compared to just just solving from scratch. So it it makes a big a big difference um, in these these task motion planning problems where we're considering these these different task uh, task plans. Um, so let me say a little bit about what's going on on this this constraint stack. Um, so we have, uh, I guess, four kinds of assertions. So one assertion for the start state, an assertion for uh, the transition function holding between successive steps, uh, an assertion for the, the goal condition, and then uh, these motion feasibility constraints. And I'll, I'll say more about what that looks like in just a minute. Um, so we start by pushing the start state, saying the start state must hold at step zero. Then we push a uh, constraint for the transition function at, at step one, uh, and for the goal condition. Oh, sorry. At uh, at step uh, start at step one. Uh, so then we'll we'll check satisfiability of the um, the conjunction of these these assertions. Uh, so if that doesn't work, uh, we'll pop off this constraint for the goal condition, uh, and then push another constraint for a transition function at at step one. So this is. This is representing uh, a, a two-step plan, a plan with two actions. Uh, so if this works, then we'll go off to the motion plan or try to find the motion plans for those, those actions. Um, if we can find the motion plans, then, then we're done. Uh, if we can't find the motion plans, then we'll push uh, some kind of motion feasibility constraints. So based on what the motion planner has done, uh, we'll, we'll guide the task planner to find some, some different task plan uh, and then continue trying to find these alternate task plans. If we run out of these, these two-step plans, then we'll pop the back down to this, this goal condition, uh, push another transition function and, and continue. So extending this, uh, the length of the plans where we're finding um, uh, and, and exploring these, these different, different task, task plans. Uh, okay, so let me... Uh, just so that I can actually follow, uh, when you say adding a transition function, can you explain again what, what exactly, which transition function? And yeah, yeah, so this is, if you think about as uh, the, the task domain as this, this finite automaton, right? Right, the part of this finite automaton is a transition function, right? So what is, 
what is the relation on the states from uh, step I to step I plus one? Okay, so right for the concrete example, right to to pick up a block, right the hand has to be empty at step I, right, and then the hand will be not empty at step I plus one, right. So that's something you would include within that transition function. And and so when I say do that at at step zero, that means that I equals zero, and then here I equals one. Right, so this is those those relations, right? Some relation on the predicates between step zero and step one for this this part, and then some relation on the predicates from step one to step two for this. And so the word function means Boolean function in your case. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. And the transition function means Boolean function that relates to effects like in a strip store or so. Yeah. So. Um, I mean, there are some equivalent ways you can def define it. Right. One is. Uh, a function from um, a state in an action to the successor state, um, right? That's sort of the classic finite automata way to define this transition function. Um, the way mm -hmm. we would define it for the constraint solver is a function on the state at step i and the state at step i plus one, and and then this will be true if it's a valid transition. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Okay. Helps. Okay, so so let me say now about these these motion feasibility constraints. So um, right, if we we try to find some some motion plan for a particular action, uh, and this times out. Uh, so the very simplest thing we could do is to just try to find any different task plan, and then see if if that would work. So we we add this assertion where uh, at least one of these these actions uh, from our previous plan uh, must be uh, must be different. Okay, so if we add this this um, uh, additional constraint to the give, give it to to the solver, uh, then we'll we'll find some different task plan, and, and effectively we'll be enumerating um, all of the different um, um, valid uh, task plans. Uh, so we can we could do a little bit better than that. So rather than each constraint pruning just a single task plan, uh, we could try to prune um, task plans that contain the state where uh, where uh, motion planning failed. So from uh, this particular task state, which is a, a discrete abstraction of the, the scene, um, we can then add, add an assertion to not, not retry uh, that, the action that failed or that, that timed out from that, that particular uh, state. Uh, so now we'll prune not a single plan, but a set of plans that contain this failed state action pair. Uh, and we can do uh, better even than that. Um, so as, as we do motion planning, right, in, within a sampling-based planner, you, you sample a new state and you try to connect this state to your tree. And then you do a bunch of, um, for manipulator, you do a bunch of collision checks of, of different uh, possible states. Um, so if collision checking fails, right, typically in, in motion planning, you just throw that, that state away and, and go, go along. Uh, but what we can actually do is, when we detect collisions, we can record uh, what objects were in collision. Um, and so, so the idea here is that it's, it's only going to be some of the objects in the scene that are occluding the robot's motion. And so we want to figure out what are these occluding objects, right? Maybe there's something in the back of the room that doesn't, doesn't affect us, so we don't want to worry about that. But we have some, some box or something in front that, that is, is obstructing the, the motion of, of the robot. Uh, so we, we record these. Um, pairs of collisions between the robot and some other object. Uh, and then if, if, we, if motion planning times out, then we will add a constraint to not retry this action uh, from any state where those, those detected uh, collisions, right, where those objects are still in those same places. Um, so, so now we're, we're going to prune not a single state, but a set of states where those uh, obstructing, including objects, uh, potentially including objects, are, are in their, their present locations. Right, so whenever any of those objects are in their, their present locations, we will not retry this, this failed action. Right? So now we're pruning not just uh, a single state, but a set of states where, uh, uh, where the, those objects are in, in, in those present locations. Um, OK, so if we compare the uh, planning times for these, these different um, kinds of constraints, right? pruning a single plan, this is exponential time. Pruning um, a, uh, based on the state we're planning failed, this is like slightly better exponential time. Um, 
But if we are pruning um, based on the detected collisions, now this takes us to uh, sub uh, empirically at least uh, sub exponential time in um, uh, by by getting this this feedback from the uh, uh, the motion planner, right? So I, th I think this um, is a nice nice result that by by getting this feedback from the motion planner to guide uh, task planning, um, we can much more rapidly um, guide the task planner towards um, plans that are more likely to be feasible at at the motion level. Um, so I think this this you know, demonstrates the need to to have some coupling between the the task planning and and, and the motion planning and not you know, treat these as wholly independent uh, black black boxes. Could, could you okay. explain briefly what the like the task is on the left? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. So um, here we're trying to pick up this blue block, uh, and so we've we'll have some number of other blocks in front, and so we we've constrained the robot to have to pick it up from the side. So basically, however many blocks are in, in front, it'll have to move out of the way first. Okay. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, and then we have like similar tasks here. I pick up pick up this this blue block or, or rearrange all of these blocks. Um, so to test the the scalability of of task planning. Um, so we compare this to um, a previous task in motion planner doing a graph search. Um, and so we do get better scalability from uh, from using these these constraint uh, constraint solvers. Um, okay, so let me say a little bit about implementation of of task and motion planning. Um, so I it, there, there's a lot involved as as I'm I'm sure you know. So I'll, I'll give you uh, our our story on on how we have put these things together. Um, so so right so at a high level right we're combining this Z three constraint solver with um, OMPL uh, for sampling-based motion planning. Uh, here's an outline of the different software components that are in, involved in, in our implementation. Um, and so, you know, as, as you know, there's there's a lot that has has to go on. Um, what what we found um, is that once once we sort of figured out what were the key abstractions in doing task motion planning, then kind of everything sort of we figured out how it could fit together. Right before uh, before that, it was the picture was not 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 clear how you would even even go about this. But you know, once we figured, okay, for the the for task planning, right, we have this this language. So in the formal language, right, language in automata theory sense, right, that we can construct from PDDL and then and then do task planning over. Um, and then for motion planning, you have this this scene graph or for a robot, an arm, a kinematic tree, right. This is the the abstraction for. Um, uh, for motion planning, right? So you have these these two key abstractions for the the task planning side and and the motion planning side, uh, and then kind of everything revolves around those those abstractions. Then then this becomes kind of a manageable uh, implementation uh, problem, uh, and then we we have this domain semantics that relates these two that I'll I'll say a little bit more about in in a couple slides. Um, so right, PDDL is this de facto standard for um, defining uh, task planning domains. Um, you know, some many people like it. I guess some people don't like it for for some reason. Uh, but it, you know, it's it's often uh, useful and and at least good enough. Uh, maybe there are some things where some other rep representation would would be would be preferable. Um, but uh, but but you know, it's 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 a way of defining this formal language for the the task planning. Uh, so then for motion planning. Um, Maybe not so much a standard format, but at least mathematically, everybody everybody does a, a comparable uh, thing, right? So you have this this graph or tree of um, relative uh, coordinate frames, and then some kind of some kind of uh, relative rigid transformation between the two that that is a function of of the the joint angle. Um, and so, right, the old-fashioned way to do this is with, with DH parameters. The modern way is with the product of exponentials, uh, and then there are some different different file formats, URDF and Collada, to to define this this kinematics. Um, but I, I think everybody is is sort of on the same page about how how mathematically you you define the configuration space for uh, for a robot manipulator. Okay, and then to to combine these, we use this. Um, this domain semantics. So these are basically functions that map from um, 
that, that do abstraction and that, that do refinement. So mapping from um, a scene, the geometry, to a task state. So building this discrete abstraction uh, and then doing refinement of task actions to, uh, to a motion planning problem or to a, to a motion plan. So from, from the task plan, how do we find these corresponding motion plans? Um, so, I mean, defining the semantics this way gives us some, some separation of the, um, the domain for task and motion planning from our particular algorithm. And you now this has been kind of a, a, an issue we've had in comparing different approaches to task and motion planning. And, and I'm not saying this is the ultimate way to do it. Um, that we end up baking a lot of assumptions into our implementations. Um, and, and so kind of trying to remove as many of those assumptions as possible, I think is, is the right, right direction. So we can apply to different, different kinds of problems and, and, and do some, get, get, get better comparisons between, uh, between approaches. Um, okay, so let me move on now to talk about uh, completeness and feasibility in, in task and motion planning. Uh, so uh, we have some some work with a, a current PhD student at uh, at Rice. Uh, so this is a a learning based approach. So we we start with our our um, incremental constraint based task and motion planning, and kind of insert in the middle of that this classifier. So before we try to refine some task plan into motion plans, we'll first run it through this classifier to quickly, uh, kind of as a heuristic, estimate whether that task plan is feasible or, or not. Um, and, and so this is, this is much faster than, um, than running the motion planner until timeout in the case that the plan is, is infeasible. Uh, so we train the classifier for these kind of minimal tabletop scenes with, with two objects, and we, we construct a, a feature vector from the relative positions and dimensions of, of the objects. And so we use this um, to, to train a, a classifier uh, based on whether, uh, in this case, whether I think the robot can pick up the red block based on where the blue block is. Um, so, right, and then we, we want our robot to be able to pick up more than, uh, deal with more than two objects on a table. So we can extend from these minimal training examples uh, to more complex scenes with multiple objects and arbitrary meshes. So for multiple objects, we consider feasibility, right, just pair objects pairwise. So if I want to pick up, you know, object I, I'll look at every other object and see, run that through the classifier to see if that object is occluding um, uh, the, the motion. And then for, for these arbitrary meshes, uh, we use an inscribed prism as the geometry uh, to, to evaluate with, with the classifier. And so um, what this does is it doesn't produce any, um, this, this approximation will not cause any, any false negatives, right? Because um, there, right, there's no approximate geometry that's outside of the, the true geometry. Uh, so, so the approximation won't cause us to think that, that planning is, is infeasible um, when, when it in, in fact is. Um, and so this uh, biasing the air in this direction will, will prevent us from throwing out, discarding, um, a, a plan that would be valid because of that, that approximation. Um, and so that, that works much better with um, this, this coupling of the, the planning and, and this, this classifier. Yeah, so we don't, we don't prune any of these, these feasible uh, motions due to that approximation. Uh, so we tested this on a variety of tabletop scenes. Um, so in the case where the classifier doesn't really tell us much, we get like a little small amount of additional overhead. Um, but then in, in cases where we are able to use the classifier to, to prune some, some infeasible plans, uh, then we get order of magnitude speed ups for uh, some, some different tabletop manipulation domains. Um, so I think that, that, demonstrate, that demonstrates that this is a, a good uh, effective um, uh, approach for um, biasing the, uh, uh, the, the task and motion planning search. Um, okay, so, so that work used the classifier as kind of a heuristic, right? Approximating whether um, uh, a, an action was feasible or not. Um, our, our more recent work is now trying to construct uh, exact proofs of whether or not uh, motion, a motion planning problem is, is feasible. Um, so, okay, so for these pictures, right? In one of these, 
the robot can reach the blue block and in the other it it cannot uh right one of these problems is infeasible can you can you tell which is which i can't i can't tell by looking at it so it's i guess right this one right this one is the infeasible problem right so even even for these kind of simple problems right it's not visually it may not even be apparent uh, when when planning is is feasible or, or not um so in a classic um uh, classic motion planning, sampling-based motion planning implementation, right? We provide a configuration space, a start and a goal. We'll run our sampling-based motion planner and add nodes to our tree or our roadmap. And at some point, either we find a motion plan or we get you know, bored of running the, the planner and then we, we get, a, get a timeout. Uh, so what we want to do is um, augment this planner with some, some additional part that will in parallel with trying to construct the plan, right, constructing the search tree and, and trying to find a plan, uh, also construct some structure for an infeasibility proof. And so now, right, we construct both of these structures in parallel, the, the plan, uh, the search tree roadmap and this, this proof structure. And so at some point, then either we find a plan through that tree or we find a proof. Uh, so now we don't have to have this timeout where we don't really know what, what has happened. We either get a plan or, or a proof that planning is, is infeasible. Um, so there's been some related work on infeasibility proofs. Um, so there's been some work on finding infeasibility proofs for single rigid objects. Um, and I think part of this is dealing with this grasping and caging, right? Caging is kind of an infeasibility proof that, right, the object you have caged cannot, cannot escape. Um, there's been some work on low dimensional uh, infeasibility proofs using um, uh, alpha shapes, so in the Cartesian space, or, or doing cell decompositions. Um, so what we are trying to do is dealing not just with Cartesian spaces, but with the configuration spaces of manipulators, um, and then not trying to decompose the entire configuration space, but to uh, construct only a manifold within the configuration space to form the infeasibility proof. Uh, so here's, here's what an infeasibility proof looks like. Um, we have a manifold or polytope that is, is closed, is entirely in the obstacle region and that separates the start and, and the goal. And so if, if such a manifold or polytope exists, uh, then, then motion planning, right? If and only if such a manifold or polytope exists, then motion planning is, is infeasible. Um, so here, here's what one of those, those looks like. Uh, one of those manifolds looks like for, I think this is the, the Jago arm, right? So these red, uh, uh, red facets uh, are forming this this proof manifold. Uh, so this is an overview of our, our algorithm to construct these infeasibility proofs. So right in parallel, we run our sampling based motion planner and this part that will construct uh, construct the proof. So from some sampled point, if it's in the obstacle region, we'll construct a candidate facet uh, based around that point. So basically trying to find the biggest facet. Um, that will still remain within the obstacle region. Right? So we solve a little optimization problem for that. Um, and then from all of these candidate facets, um, our, our, our current approach is to um, then solve um, a, a constraint satisfaction problem to find a subset of those facets that form a closed polytope that separates the start and the goal. Um, so I think this, this turns into some linear constraint satisfaction problem that we, we actually solve using, using Z3 again, since that's, that's the tool that we uh, are, are at least familiar with. But, but there are a number of different solvers you could use for those, those kinds of problems. Uh, okay, and so, right, if you find, find some subset of those facets that form this closed polytope that separates the start and the goal, uh, then you have an infeasibility proof, right? So we do these two parts, this proof construction, this planning in, in parallel, and then, and then converge either to a motion plan or, or the infeasibility proof. Um, so here's uh, kind of a picture of that in, in two dimensions, right? So growing each of those facets, and then at some point we find the subset. So these red facets, right, in 2D facet is a line, these red facets that form the closed polytope, and then this other blue one was not part of the, the proof. Uh, here's what it looks in, in 3D. So right between the kind of inner and outer spheres is the obstacle region. And so we grow all of these blue facets, and then at some point we should find um, a set of those facets that will form the, uh, the infeasibility proof. Okay. 
Okay, so we did some tests on the um, the small Jayco arm, our, uh, right, to, to, to show that this works for a real manipulator configuration space. Um, so here's, here's what this construction looks like for the Jayco arm. So we're growing all of these facets, um, right? And the, we don't show the, the obstacle region here because it looks, you know, it looks weird. Uh, but we can, we can see these facets for, for the Jayco arm. And then, and then at some point we find uh, a, a subset of those facets that form that, that closed polytope in the obstacle region that, that constitutes the infeasibility proof. Um, so here's, here's what the performance and, and the profiling of this work, uh, this algorithm looks like. So most of, um, most of the time is spent on constructing these new facets, right? So solving this optimization problem to from a particular, um, uh, from a particular point in the obstacle region, what's the biggest facet that will um, uh, that we that, that we can fit around that point? Um, so so we're able to do this in in up to three degrees of freedom for the Jayco arm, but there's still a lot of work uh, to do for for real um, uh, larger degree of freedom robots, right? So um, you know we put we put towards in the title of the paper, right? So that means that some things work and some things don't. Uh, so, so what, what works in, in this so far, right? So we have a general approach to represent and construct uh, in feasibility proofs. Um, this will, can integrate with a variety of sampling-based planners, right? We just need to kind of pluck out points from, that, that, um, from the sampling process. Uh, and then we've, we've shown that this works on the configuration space for uh, a low degree of freedom serial manipulator. Uh, so what still needs some work? Um, so we didn't really prove uh, convergence. Uh, so we're using some heuristics to grow the facets. Um, uh, this deserves some additional analysis to uh, either to prove that this this will will definitively converge or or not. Um, and, and then computation time and scalability is is still still continues to be an issue. So uh, this problem is uh, seems amenable to parallelization. Uh, so we could parallelize facet construction or try to reuse some of the work in this linear constraint satisfaction problem uh, to find the polytopes. Um, so, so we're continuing to work on this. Um, our, I think our, our recently submitted results, we're dealing with four degrees of freedom now. Um, so and we'll, we have some ideas to, to scale to uh, the kind of typical you know, five and six and seven degrees of freedom we have on, on serial manipulators. Um, okay, so I think I'll, I'll briefly tell you a bit about quaternion kinematics. Um, I think I talked fast enough. Uh, so, so kinematics shows up um, all over the place, right? If you're doing manipulation or animation or, or simulation. Um, so why should we care about quaternions? Um, so if you just want some numbers, right? It's faster for a little bit faster for, for forward kinematics. It's a lot faster for inverse kinematics. Um, and uh, analytically, it also is, is pretty nice. Um, so if you if you open up a textbook on on kinematics uh, robot kinematics these days, it'll it'll describe them using this product of exponentials, right? So you have all of these screw axes and, and angles, and you take exponentials of these, and this gives you this analytically very nice way of of dealing with the, the kinematics of of a robot manipulator. Um, so you know, can we can we make this a little better even with with quaternions? Um, so why why not quaternions? Um, well, these these seem to be controversial for for some reason or another, right? The typical reaction you get when when you bring up quaternions is that well they're they're cool or they're weird or they're evil. Uh, okay, so this is actually not a a new reaction, right? So if you go back to Maxwell, he says right the ideas of quaternions are fit to be of the greatest use in all parts of science. Uh, and the counter argument from Lord Kelvin is that quaternions have been an unmixed evil to all who have touched them, uh, including Maxwell. Uh, so, okay, um, you know, trash, trash talking dead guys aside, um, you know, quaternions are, are useful, right? Analytically, they're nice, and and computationally, they'll give us some nice, nice properties. Um, so let me, I'll skip through this Euler's formula bit and just show you the dual quaternion. Um, so right, here's the dual quaternion, right? This combination of the unit ordinary quaternions and the, the dual numbers. Um, so you have a, a rotation quaternion 
and then you have this translation vector that that will form the dual part uh, of the the dual quaternion, and this this represents a, a Euclidean transformation. Um, so there's there's good and bad news about textbook dual quaternions. Um, they're a little bit more compact than matrices, so that's good. Uh, bad is that it actually takes more operations to chain a dual quaternion than a transformation matrix. And the ugly news is that there's a singularity at the um, uh, the zero angle for the log and, and exponential. Um, so what, is, what does that mean? If you open up this textbook on dual quaternions, you see this angle that appears in the denominator, right? So, so you get a singularity at, at the zero angle uh, for this, this exponential. So that's, that's bad. Um, but we can deal with this with a couple of tricks. So first we can remove singularities using a Taylor series, uh, and then we can use quaternion trigonometry to find the right um, expressions to, to, to do this. Uh, so um, if you probably remember from- Neil, Calculus can, I, class. can I interrupt just to- Yeah, go ahead, please. To, to stay on board with you. So um, the, the, the naive people like myself, would think obviously you can use quaternions to uh, represent rotations. That's what we do always, uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. And you use just normal free vectors uh, for the for the translation, and you have seven mm -hmm. numbers, and that's it. Yeah, and everything is good. So I didn't know about dual quaternions. Yeah, why care about dual quaternions? Uh, so computationally, it's faster. And um, right, Which so if, I, if you exactly? have your if you have your sorry, what was that? Mark? Which operation exactly is faster? Uh, for for both forward kinematics, it's a little bit faster than the matrices, and um, uh, and for inverse kinematics, right? We get a several times speed up from using quaternions and the analysis, really, right? Being able to to find gradients. But, but um, I, I'm I'm not comparing to like forward chaining uh, with matrices. I mean, forward yeah. chaining with just quaternion and a vector. Yeah. So what's what's like the logarithm of that? Um, I don't care. Oh, you mean the, the logarithm? Yeah. Of, so if you're doing inverse kinematics, complexity? right, right, you want to find errors of 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 this, um, uh, right? Uh, you want to find um, errors between two different transformations, right? So so the typical way to do this would be with a logarithm. Right? Oh, oh, uh, the, the, okay. Now you're you one step ahead. So it's not only about forward chaining because we're yeah. talking about the, the complexity, computation, complexity of forward chaining. So, but yeah, so th that's that's uh, agreed. Like using quaternions for rotation representation mm -hmm. is faster than using uh, matrices, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. Agree. And okay. now you're talking about uh, defining metrics in that space, like errors. Yeah. Um, yeah, so in we can. You would just usually just use, you know, the, the Euclidean distance actually, which is not a proper net metric, of course. We know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I mean, if, if you want some, you know, um, a, a number that relates to the the rotation angle, right? This is this is what you get from the the logarithm, right? The logarithm of the quaternion is. Uh, gonna gonna give you that that rotation angle. That's um, true, but why would we want to know exactly the rotation angle if we only care about like having a like uh, never mind. So uh, having a metric in rotation space, you can just use Euclidean metric in the quaternions, and that is a, like a metric that you can use for inverse kinematics or things like that if you want. Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess you know, is is there kind of a simpler or, or a computationally faster metric you could use for not just rotation, but for for the, the full transformation. Would you not just add the, the Euclidean distance in quaternion plus the Euclidean distance in 3D? That's what I'm usually doing. And the scaling, um, I agree, is like arbitrary by just adding them. Yes, yes, yeah. So you can you can you can do that, yeah. Okay. 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 Maybe okay. I'm just doing things weird. I'm, I'm not sure. Anyhow. Um, so well, maybe you can also explain these dual quaternions now. They, okay. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it would be more useful for me to have not skipped through that that part. Right. Um, I know quaternions. I, I was, but I was trying to be, be mindful of, of some time for discussion, but I think we're, we're interspersing the discussion. So which, which, which is fine. Um, 
Right. So, okay. So we've all seen Euler's formula for uh, um, the complex numbers, right? We know that the, uh, the quatern ordinary quaternions have these, these three, uh, uh, three basis elements. Um, and then what are, what are dual numbers? So dual numbers are based on this dual element uh, where the square of the dual element is, is zero, but the dual element is, is not zero. Um, so you can actually construct one of these from this, this nil potent matrix. So it's not, not imaginary, it's, it's dual. Um, and, then, and then a dual quaternion is this, this combination of, of the ordinary quaternions where you have a, a real part and then a, a, a dual part. Okay. Uh, so mm -hmm. you have eight, eight different factors for all of these different, um, different combinations of the quaternion um, elements, uh, quaternion, quaternion units and, and this, this dual, dual element. Um, okay, and, and, then, and then this dual quaternion is, is this combination of here's your ordinary rotation quaternion, and then we construct a, a dual part from, from the translation vector. Um, and so chaining of dual quaternions is just a multiplication. So analytically, this is, um, this is nice because you can um, uh, use the, the calculus chain rule when you're, you're finding derivatives. Um, so, so for analysis, I mean, it's the same as for matrices, right? So for analysis, uh, dual quaternions and, and matrices are, are, are nice. And um, uh, computationally, I think thinking about the, the representation as a dual quaternion um, is, uh, is, is helpful. Uh, so did, did that give you a little picture, yeah, Mark? Yeah, that on... helped, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry for skipping that. I shouldn't have, shouldn't have done that. Um, Oh, okay. Um, right. So to get rid of these singularities, right, we can um, rem use Taylor series. So if you look at this function, it looks like there's a singularity at, at zero. But if you take take a Taylor series, um, you find actually at zero, this this sine cardinal will evaluate uh, to to one. So it, we can find some of these factors that look like they have singularities, then find the Taylor series and and remove the singularities. Um, and then right, the the challenge is to find what are these factors for, for finding the, the Taylor series? Um, and so the other, other trick is to consider the trigonometry of, of a quaternion. So if you, you project the imaginary part of a quaternion onto a plane, so we have now one axis for the real part and then another axis for the magnitude of the imaginary part. And then now we have some angle between the real and imaginary part. And this angle is actually related to the rotation angle. Uh, for, for the ordinary unit quaternions. Um, so then this gives you some, I, I think, uh, visual insight into what, what the quaternion is doing. And you can now do some substitution between these magnitude of V and this, these, this trigonometric trig function magnitude or, or W value and this, this trig, trig function um, to, to, to find things you can, you can take Taylor series of. Um, okay, so yeah, we just said this, right? Uh, you can represent, uh, uh, Euclidean transformation using matrices or using dual quaternions, right? What many roboticists actually do is this, this ordinary quaternion and this, this translation vector. Um, and what I think is, is helpful is to think about this quaternion plus translation vector as, as a dual quaternion um, or as, as ev even an in-memory representation uh, of, of a dual quaternion. Uh, because it lets you do this analysis, right, chaining and, and finding gradients and logs and exponentials um, as, as a dual quaternion, right? I don't know what, but um, so, right, if you chain these, right, it's not really a, a multiplication operation, right? It's, you can't, analytically, it's not very nice. Um, and I don't know what the log or exponential of this would be, but I do know what a log and exponential of a dual quaternion is, right? So, so thinking about this analytically as, as a dual quaternion, I think, I think is helpful. Um, uh, just a quick one. Because you're talking about log and exponential of this, uh, this is just a product space of two groups, right? So this is just a product of one Lie group and of a normal Euclidean group. And isn't the log and the exponential of that just decomposed? You just take the log and the exponential of the rotation, and just the the, the normal, because the translation group is not you know it's trivial. Uh, you have the tangent space right there. So why is it? Why did you say it's unclear what the log and the exponential is in the right on the right box? Okay, well may, maybe I don't know enough about about Lie groups. Um, so how uh, how do you combine the the log and exponential of the quaternion and the the translation? 
I, I'm, I'm even unsure what you mean by combine. I mean, the exponential means that you take any vector in the tension space of the, of the Riemannian manifold and uh, use that vector in order to actually get the, the group element, right? That's the exponential map. And here uh, you can just do this uh, like in, in two parts. You do it for the quaternions, you do it for the translations, and, and that's it. Because the tangent space of that Riemanni manifold is just the product space of the two tangent spaces. And every operation you can do in each of these tangent spaces, you just take the product, and that's it. And that's for the exponential in the map. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. I, I, I think I, I see what you're saying, at least somewhat. Um... So for, yeah, I guess the, the way we, we want to use this for inverse kinematics, right? You want to find, um, right? You, you have some objective, which is based on, you know, the, rel the uh, orientation error, the, the, the transformation error, yep. right? So you could yep. take, right? The, the direct thing to do is to take the norm of the log, uh, but you can also add, add the norm, right? You can take, log of log of h and log of v and add them together right and that that will also work you just get like a slightly different gradient um uh, and actually now i'm wondering if if this is not exactly the same number that uh, that you would get if you use the log of the dual quaternion then i would be surprised because it should be the same number Other, otherwise it's weird otherwise they represent different things or the tension spaces are kind of like different which um, be weird. Well, yeah, I right, so so you should get um you'll get a logarithm that's um comparable, right? If you're if you're trying to take norms and you add them together versus taking the norm of the log of the dual paternity, you may get a slightly different number. Mm -hmm. Um and, and then I think there's also could, some factor. Yeah, it could, could be like which norm if we take the squared norm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um Actually, I need to run to another meeting. I just realized okay, okay, it's yeah. just five o'clock. Oh, no. Um, okay, well, well I, I think we did get some good discussion in. So, so thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Yeah, thanks for the talk. I thought it was really great. And the other part of the team, please, please keep discussing with Neil and, and yeah, ask him everything. Sorry, bye-bye, Neil. Okay, thank, thank you, Mark. Okay. Well, no, that was that was that was good. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, for for this this whole derivation of the dual dual quaternion uh, logs and exponentials and, and and all of that, please uh, please please see the the, the paper. Um, so the the net net result is that we can get rid of the singularities in um, the dual quaternion logarithm, and we can extend this analysis to this um, Im implicit dual quaternions and and find right, the equivalent logarithm to the, um, uh, the, the dual quaternion form, um, and then construction and chaining of this, this implicit dual quaternion, right, so this uh, ordinary quaternion and, and vector is, is uh, a little bit cheaper than either matrices or, um, uh, or, or dual quaternions. Um, so yeah, here's, here's this, this inverse kinematics problem. So I was saying it's, it's kind of nice to view inverse kinematics as an optimization problem. And I guess for a lab that does a lot of optimization, that's probably something you, you think about already. Um, right, so we want to minimize some, some distance uh, to a target pose subject to, uh, to joint limits. Um, so the, the classic approaches to do this are these newton raphson or um, uh, levenberg marquette approaches. Um, so the, the problem is that these are not especially robust um, with joint limits. You can end up, right, you, you, you hit a joint limit and you, you end up having to kind of clamp the configuration at the joint limit and, and this can, can um, lead to, to poor convergence. Um, so the, the modern approach to do this is with this um, uh, constraint optimization and, and specifically what people seem to use a lot is, is the sequential quadratic programming approach. Um, so a number of recent recent um, authors have have used this, and this this is nice because it it will uh, directly handle joint limits. Um, so, but but what you need to do this well is the gradients of of the objective or or of any any constraints. Um, and if you look uh, at the code from Beeson and, and Ames, it actually does finite difference. 
um, which which works fine, right? It's it's robust, uh, but it's slower because you have to perturb each of those configurations to find the finite difference gradient. Um, but to find analytic, you, if you want to do analytic gradients, right? This takes some effort to do the the derivation, and then maybe we end up with these singularities uh, again. Um, uh, but we can do this the same kind of quaternion ana analysis. Um, take these Taylor series to find these these analytic gradients. Uh, so here's uh, here's the the result, and I guess right that maybe the speed up is the important column. So comparing finite difference for here's the log of the dual quaternion um, uh, uh, norm of the log of the relative dual quaternion, and here's what I, I think Mark and I were saying earlier. Right, you can take the log of the ordinary quaternion norm of that, and then add that to the uh, the translation error. And this this is actually a little bit faster. I think you only need some operations here are going to be four by four matrices versus uh, eight by eight matrices um, uh, here. Um, so so this ends up being you know both pretty robust and and using the analytic gradients is is faster to uh, to compute. Um, so so yeah, I think. Uh, uh, Thinking of um, uh, so representing things as as dual quaternions or as this quaternion and, and translation vector, um, and then thinking about this analytically as, as a dual quaternion can um, uh, can can be be helpful. Um, okay, so in in the end of tangent. Um, so there's some we've done this this work on on task and motion planning. So identifying these these abstractions using this this constraint based approach. Um, then our, our recent and continuing work is now addressing this completeness and, and feasibility problem and trying to construct in exact infeasibility proofs for, for motion planning. Um, and then a bit of a, a tangent work on um, quaternion kinematics. So uh, yeah, thank, thanks very much for, um, uh, for listening to, to the talk. Yeah, thank you.